Okay, so um, RNA-seq. The great thing about it is it allows you to measure everything that's happening on a genome-wide basis for transcription. Um, and the, really the power of it, like I think we all know is getting this kind of genome wide view all simultaneously allows you to start to infer what's happening on a kind of global level for, for transcription. And then you can start comparing it between different uh, conditions and things like that to understand what's uh, changing. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're often trying to look at between deep defined groups, whether it's a, uh, a wild type versus a mutant, or you're adding a drug treatment and things like that, you want to be able to understand what's happening, what, what things are different, and not just look at it in a kind of candidate forward approach where you're like, I know this gene is interesting. We want to be able to find, find the genes that are interesting in an un, unbiased way. Um, yeah, and so this is often when we, we're talking about this is we're talking about differential uh, gene, gene transcript or gene or transcript expression, DGE. It's quite a common acronym that's used. Um, uh, another approach that's often um, also used, but it's less common, is differential transcript usage analysis. Um, and so this is really nice because it allows you to identify different isoforms that are in use. Okay, and so you, there might be a switch in which a specific exon. So you can see here from these tracks, we have the uh, usage of these are two. These two here are two um, different isoforms of a gene, and in the red you can see that this bottom model is used because you can see expression here, 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 and here. And then in the, in the green, you can see that both these models are used because you can see expression here, 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 and here still, but you can also see expression here and here. So this corresponds to both sets being used. So suddenly there's a new isoform being uh, transcribed. And so what we're gonna be covering in, in the uh, kind of in our workflow um, over the next two days is we're going to be covering actually just these first four. So what I just mentioned with this differential transcript utilization analysis, we do have slides for this. We're just not going to cover it in any sessions just for interest of time. Um, but if you're interested in this, we do, if you go to the fifth, um, you go down to here, number five, you can dig into this. And it, it's a good set of courses uh, or slides, and you should be able to dig into it by yourself if you're comfortable with the first, um, first four. Um, specifically over these sessions, we'll also be using a, a, a data set from Christina Leslie's lab at MSKCC, and it's about T, T reg cells. Um, and so you can download it from here and here. We do have some intermediate, intermediate data though, which um, is contained in the course content. And so unless you wanna process the whole data set, you don't necessarily have to do this. And then the last thing we're setting up is once you've downloaded the course content, we um, so that all the paths that we show you to these kind of intermediate files, such as like counts and things like that, so that um, your R session can find it, we recommend you send your working directory to a specific location. So you'll want to set it to path to download RU RNA seq master. And actually, you'll want to navigate into the R course directory within this. Okay. So I can actually show you that um, in my R studio. Yeah. So I have that here. And so I downloaded the RNA seq course here. Um, onto my desktop. And then I navigated it into the R course section. And so now if I look inside it, there should be a data directory, there should be a presentations and an exercises directory. These are the three most important ones. The data contains all this intermediate data that you might want to use. The exercises contains the exercises and the presentations contains what we're looking at um, in, this, in the sessions. And so you can access this all offline then as well. So you can open up the, this presentation. And if you want to do it while, while you're traveling somewhere and you don't have Wi-Fi, you can. Okay, so 
let's get into the fun parts, working with raw RNA-seq data. So typically, um, when you run an RNA-seq uh, data set, you're going to be putting it onto an Illumina platform, um, unless you're doing like single cell, but here we're focused on bulk. And when we put it off the Illumina platform, there'll be some demultiplexing and you'll be given a FASTQ file. Okay, and so within the FASTQ file, there is lots of lines and each of these lines correspond to a, um, well, each, each four lines corresponds to a read. Uh, it contains lots of information such as the sequence information and then also quality scores. Um, and so in previous, uh, in an, another um, set of courses, we show you how to read these FASTQ files in. We show you how to like start to break them down. If you want to create your own plots using looking at the quality and things like that, you can do that. Um, you can, it uses this package called short read, which is from Bioconductor. And so you can just click on this link and it'll take you, take you there if you want to explore that further. But most of the time, like that, like reading everything in takes a lot of memory. Um, it's quite intensive and like, it's not actually what, you need necessarily. And most of the time, you just want to do some basic quality control, make sure the fast queue looks okay, and then um, take this kind of quality controlled fast queue and do your actual analysis on it. And so for, th for that, we use a package called RFASP. And so this was actually developed by our team. Um, and so you can see it's, you may recognize some of these names, Thomas Carroll, who's the head of our team and also JD and Wei, who are also members of the team, they created a wrapper for a program called FASTP, which allows super fast, it's very, it's very quick, um, quality control of FASTQ files. And it's super straightforward, okay? So if you want, you can download this full FASTQ file with this code here. This will download it. This might take a little bit of time but we have a subset of this available here. So if you've navigated to um, into the download of the, the course download and navigated into the R course section, within the data folder, there is a file called this, sampled this ID sampled fastq.gz. And so this is just a smaller version with subset it, but all the principles still apply. Okay, so all we have to do when we um, want to run our fastp is we use the our fastp function. Okay, so you'll have your R Studio open, and as this is the first time we're actually really using R, I'll show you in action. Okay, so we do uh, here. Okay, and so. We use this our fastp function. We need to tell it what fastq file we want to do our fastp on, and we want to tell it where we want to output this, output the result. And then we also want to assign the this out to a second report. So what it does is in R it creates a report, and then outside of R, which is where this is going to be, it creates a fastq file. Okay. So if I just run that. Now, I need to load in our fastp first, and it has a capital. Okay, so it started to run the fast and uh, the quality control. Um, it's processing all of the the data, and it went through that entire fast queue in a couple seconds. So that was super quick. Um, so go back to this. So that is how quick you can do your quality control on your, your FASTQ file, okay? But you actually wanna have a look at what, what that's done. So within R, you can have a look or with outside of R. So if you've run FASTP, it creates several files in that have this um, like prep end. And, and so you can see here, it's created these three files. We have a fastq.gz. This is a fastq file that's had all the bad reads sorted out, low quality reads. It's created a HTML file. This is a HTML report that has some quality control statistics. And then it's created a JSON. And so a JSON is a 
um, a type of a file format that just has all the numbers associated with this quality control. Okay. And the JSON is what's actually saved in your R session. So this here is a JSON report. And so on this JSON report within your R session, you can actually just start to get some information about how that went. And so we can use a function called QC summary on the JSON report. And it will tell you how um, your QC did. So it will tell you things about um, how many reads you had before and after the quality control, how many total bases there are, um, and some of the, the, the rate of quality bases um, so at different levels of quality, the read mean length, and the GC content. OK, and so what you can see here is this contained a million reads, this file. And after quality control, we have 996,000, OK? And so we filtered out a very small number of reads. And so the default settings for RFRSP is it filters out low quality reads. And so this means reads that typically they're full of ends, they're full of uh, just things that are just probably don't represent real, a real sequencing uh, result. You can also generate some plots from RFASP. And so there's a function called curve plot. And so what curve plot does as a default is it shows you the beforehand and the after, uh, after quality control. Um, it shows you the GC content, okay, per base. And so this is a, very, a pretty typical graph. You often um, have at the beginning have Oh, sorry, this is um, quality. GC content is a, the second plot, okay? Uh, I'll show you the GC content in a sec. And um, so, um, yeah, so this is showing the base quality and it's showing per base. So this, sorry, this has been cut off, but it's uh, from the left to the right. It's showing the start of the read so position one, position two, position three within the read. And so it's very normal for you to start off with very low quality or relatively low quality within a, within a, a read. And then as the sequencer gets going, it gets better. Um, yeah, and so you can see comparing read one before to read one after, there is a slight increase in the, the quality because you've removed the bad reads on average. But it, there isn't really, you aren't drastically changing the data set when you do this filtering. So that's a good thing. Um, there is also, I, yeah, with our fast, fast P, I can actually show you, um, yeah. Um, let me just help. Okay, I just got a quick question. Uh, I can't uh, install RFOSP. It's giving you an error. It doesn't exist. Okay, so RFOSP should, we can go to the page here, by conduct page. I think the issue is you have a capital P at the end. So this is the package name, RFOSP. Um, so, Jesse, if you uh, try it again without the capital P at the end, you should be good. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this here. So here. Sorry, I wasn't sharing the screen when I showed that. Um, I was just showing you my R. Okay, but Jesse, it seems like you figured it out. Okay, so this is the plot I just showed you. And then if we look at the curve plot option, the question mark, we can get help. It defaults to curves about quality curves. Um, but you can also look at, uh, if you give it a separate argument, say I want the curves, but I want them to be um, content. 
Oops. Now it shows you um, GC content. And again, I think the most important thing for this is you don't want like massive changes as a, as a result of your filtering. The only thing we'd want to filter out, right, is the propensity of having ends, which was so low anyway, and the amount of filtering we're doing is very low. So we're not expecting a massive shift. Um, but the change in quality is expected, right? You remove out the bad reads, you have a slight increase in quality. Okay, so go back to the slides. Um, actually, I was going to switch back to here anyway. Okay, sorry if this is switching back too much. Um, so RFSP has a ton of options, okay? It's really great. Um, I've shown you how to run it on default, but a lot of people don't want to just run it on default. You might have specific adapters that you, that you have. You might want to use specific quality um, thresholds. And so if, if um, you're one of those people, you can see there is a lot of options, okay? And so I'm not gonna go into them um, because it is also specific to each person. For your standard RNA-seq, using the defaults is great, okay? Um, if you have paired end also, just to note, there is paired end options as well, okay? So you have a read one, read two um, options for it. Um, yeah, that is your quality control. And that's that's all we do these days. Um, we, we check it through our fast P, we look at some of the quality plots and we make sure nothing looks awry. Okay. Um, like I said, if you've, if we, um, oh yeah, so the question is from Anandita, um, the default is single end. Yes, the default is single end. It expects you to provide one fast key file. Um, that, that, but it is ready for um, more, um, and it totally can handle it. Yeah, so like I said, if you want to dig more into your, say you have a bad run, something looks funny when you do the orig original QC, normally we can tell from just this if something's awry, and then we dig further into it, and we can use packages like short read, which, um, as I mentioned before, in other sections of the courses, we dig much, much deeper into. Um, but um, for this, this is, this is perfectly fine, okay? Um, and so the next step is aligning. And so the fast Q in isolation doesn't tell you that much. It tells you the quality of your, of your, of your reads, but it's, an, it's not telling you anything about the position, okay? And so we need to use an aligner to actually find out the position of where these reads belong to so that we can actually then count. Um, and specifically with RNA-seq, this is a little bit more complicated because it doesn't map in a consecutive pattern. You often have exons, right, that are, that are split with introns in between them. And so you can have a, a read spanning two exons and there could be a killer base in between. Uh, right in the middle. And so how do you map something when it's not contiguous? And so there's specific aligners which allow us to do that. Um, they're called splice aware aligners, okay? Um, if you want, again, a lot of our slides have links and they take you to previous and other courses where we've dug into more detail. We have an entire hour session just on alignment um, and using different aligners, okay? So you can click on this link and go and look at that if you get really into alignment or you want to try, try up some different tools. When you do alignment, the result is a BAM file. And so this contains all the information that was in the FASTQ file, but it also contains some position information. So this is the first, first um, read from a BAM file. It contains the information. This is um, information about the specific read. This is the ID of the read, but it also tells you it's on chromosome two. It's at the, this position on chromosome two. This is the sequence. And then this is the quality score. Okay. Um, oh. Okay. Does that link not work? Okay, so that link doesn't work. Okay, so I'm telling you to go to these links, and this one doesn't work. Um, but you can go. This specific link goes to our bioconductor course, and within the bioconductor course, there's a section on alignment. Okay. So when you do alignment, um, for the algorithm to work, um. There are several steps that it's, it's a very intensive process. 
right? And if, if you just imagine it on a like a, just a very logical basis, you, and it's a very simplified, you have maybe 50 base pairs, which you're trying to find the best match against something, maybe it's like the human genome or something, where you're dealing with billions of bases, lots of different options where it can fit. And so doing that for one read can take a long time. So imagine doing it for then millions of reads, hundreds of millions of reads. Um, and so there's lots of steps which help optimize the speed of this matching process. And so one of the things um, that helps is you build something called an index. And what an index does is it is it's a, a version of the genome that has been optimized for the searching, okay? And so when you're doing this searching and alignment, it, it, it speeds up that process quite considerably um, it, that compared to if you just wanted to use the, the raw sequence. And so the, to build a um, reference genome, um, there, there are lots of reference gen genomes available just online, um, but we often recommend you build your own because then you know exactly what version of the genome it was built from um, and you, you have complete control over everything. And so when we build reference genomes, what we do is we actually extract the um, genome information from a bioconductor package. So all of the FASTA sequences associated with the different model organisms are contained within um, packages online available that are version controlled through Bioconductor. And so the one for mouse and specifically the MM10 version of mouse is in a package called BS Genome M Musculus UCSC. So it's the UCSC version, um, MM10. And um, there are alternative versions as well. And so we, we always go with the, this guy, okay? And so you can install this. This installation can take a little bit of time because you are essentially downloading the genome. Um, we can load it in just like we would any other package. Um, and then we have this object within our R session called BS Genome M Oscillus. And you can see if you, it's in a kind of an abstract um, object. Um, if you just type it into your R session, it returns a bunch of information, okay? It tells you it has 239 different sequences. Okay, and so it has the main chromosomes, but it also has a bunch of patches and fixes for the for and and unassigned segments as well. Okay, and so what we want to be able to do is extract out that information to then build a our own uh, reference genome, and so to do that we have to create something called a DNA string set. And so we specifically want to just stick to the main chromosomes to keep it simple. So what we're doing here is we're doing paste. We're pasting chromosome to 1 to 19, x, y, and m. And so this means we create a vector. And um, so I can show you what that looks like. It's a little confusing. So if I just do that. And so I'm, I, I'm saying, I want these chromosomes. I don't want to worry about all these unassigned objects or patches for now. You can if you want to for yours, but we're keeping it simple. And then what we're doing is we're taking this, this object that we create, main chromosomes, which has our vector of all these names, and we create this function, which we use L apply on. And we're saying we want to go through this vector and use indexing to extract out the chromosome information associated with all of these um, different chromosomes, okay? And so this, this step is a little confusing, but essentially what we're doing is we're extracting out all of the um, FASTA file um, or sequence information associated with each chromosome. Um, and so I can, I can give you a quick demo of... Uh, let me just load this in. So I'm just loading in the BS genome object. Let's see what it looks like there. So this is a BS genome object. And so if I just go like this, chromosome one, and I need to use double square brackets. 
And what it gives me is this DNA string object. And this DNA string object is the entire sequence of chromosome one. And so what this um, L apply is doing here is it's going through my vector with all these names and it's taking out that information for every single chromosome. We then convert it into this specialist object called a DNA string set. And you can see what this DNA string set looks like. It has every single chromosome that we cared about, and it's all of the FASTA information. You'll notice that it's just ends, and that's because at the end, the sequencing is not super great, right? Um, and so we don't actually know at the ends of the chromosome exactly what the bases are. But if you were to go a little bit more into the middle, then you get into the like the real known characterized sequence. But yeah, at the ends, it's just, you know, it's telomeres, repetitive elements, and things like that. Um, yeah. And so once you have this string set, you can do right x string set. You do it on this object you created. And what you're doing then is you're creating a faster file. Okay. So as, as I said before, again, you can just download one of these faster files off of a place like UCSC. But the nice thing about doing it this way through R is you know exactly where it came from, what date it was made, what version. And if you save these R scripts, you'll have it, have it uh, all saved, okay? Then we get to the actual index step. So we go to build index. So build index is a function. Um, and um, we're actually, so I didn't mention this yet. We're specifically telling you how to do alignment with a package that we like called R subread. So R subread is a very good tool for alignment. Um, it's a, we kind of describe it as a kind of a jack of all trades um, because it does a very good job, whatever you whatever you give it to. There are some aligners which may be better at, if you're very much focused on splicing, there might be a, an aligner that's better, better than that. Or if you're very much focused on single cell, maybe there's a slightly better aligner for single cell. But for having a consistent approach across all techniques, our subread does a good job. And specifically, when we're doing RNA sequencing, it has a the subjunct algorithm, OK? And so this is the one that's splice aware. And so we use the R cell breed package. And so we need to build an index, which is a specialist um, index that is appropriate for the R sub breed or, and subjunct algorithm, OK? So you can't just use a bow tie index for this, because that's been optimized for, say, bow tie mapping. This has been optimized for the R subread. OK, and so it has a, a specific function called build index. And so we can load in R subread with library R subread. We do build index. And then um, you can do MM10. So this is the name we want to give our um, index. And this is the FASTA file. OK, so this is the FASTA file we just made. and then um we specify some memory here okay and so this gets to this okay so i actually this is a perfect time for the question that i just got asked by chan cheng um uh, so some of these steps are very intensive and um, doing genomics on your personal computer is hard and um, it is doable though we try to in these sessions make it as accessible as possible and show you how you can control your memory to make it doable and um, that said for most of the stuff that we're talking at least today about um at least in this session right now we do all of these on the hpc or high performance computer so um sometimes I'll do some alignment if it's one or two files on my personal computer, but it's, it could, depending on the size of the files and things like that, it could take a lot of time. Building the index specifically is the most time consuming part. OK, so um, doing doing this on uh, your personal computer, this is a kind of step that maybe you want to run overnight. But the nice thing about this is you do it once, you save all the script information and everything, but, and you'll never have to do it again, OK? This index, you can just keep reusing for every time you, you want to map to mouse, for example, using the MM10 genome. Yeah, so this step, I use eight gigs here. 
um, that is um, the memory that you'll be using, but that might be too large for your specific laptop. Um, it all depends on what kind of RAM you have, what else you want to do at the same time. Um, and so you can optimize it and dial it down or up. But the higher the number, the quicker it will be though. Okay. We do have a question from uh, Meng Zhao, uh, how to acquire access for the high, a high performance computer. Um, so the HPC is run by a different team. Um, you can reach out to them at hpc at rockefeller.edu and they'll give you some kind of uh, pointers and give you a uh, setup. The HPC does, um, I, I won't go into like a full thing about the HPC, but it does um, have some costs associated with it, um, depending on what you're gonna do. Okay, instead of building it myself, can I download the index directly from the core? That's from Charles. Um, I, I'm not sure if we give out indexes. I could have, I can, I'll talk to, um, I'll talk to Tom about this. That is an interesting idea. We do encourage people to be self-sufficient though. Um, and so this step, building an index, like I said, it's, it's a one step um, and it, you can run it once and you'll have it for, for, for as long as that um, build is uh, valid and relevant. So although it's intense, it might tie up your computer for a little bit, it's often often worth it, okay? Um, but there are also, like I, I keep mentioning, there are places where you can download these indexes as well um, to skip these steps, but we just prefer to do it this way. So you, again, complete control. Um, we want to be as reproducible as possible and for you to be able to take all of the steps and do them yourself. Um, and what is the advantage of using this instead of bow tie? So bow tie is, um, depends what you mean by bow tie. There's bow tie, there's bow tie two, and there's high sat, there's high sat two, and these are all run by the same people. Bow tie and bow tie two are actually generally designed for um, genomic. So they don't consider uh, splicing. Then they made top hat, um, which was supposed to be RNA seq, but that's very old now. Um, and then they generally moved on to high sat. Um, in our experience, our subread does as good, if not better, in most use cases. Um, and so it just does better, better alignment. It's faster. And we work predominantly in R, and um, our subread works in R um, really well. Um, our subread is also available in Windows, which um, I'm not sure if Bowtie is. So it could be, I just, we don't use it, okay? And it's the same with like, what we'd realistically do for this kind of thing is something like HiSat, um, but which is the bow, like the bow tie equivalent, um, but um, we like our subread, okay? Um, something, if you're doing this for the first time, I, I'd recommend try, like, especially if you're doing a different organism or something like that, I'd recommend trying out several aligners, seeing which one looks the best. Okay. Cool. This is some good questions, but I am going to be running a little late. Okay. Um, and so once you've built your index, you then want to do the alignment. Okay. And so you could just run a line like this and the alignment would work really well um, using this, would use the subjunct uh, function and most of the splicing it would be fine with. Um, any canonical splicing sites that use like well-known donor sites and things like that would be, it would map to fine. Um, but sometimes there's non-canonical sites um, and these have been well characterized, but they aren't necessarily be able to be predicted by your algorithm, okay? And so to help get around this, we can also provide annotation information. So this is like known exons, introns, and where they are. And so to do this, we there is a, an additional parameter that we can supply when we do the alignment called anot.ext. Okay, and so to do this, we either provide a GTF or an SAF file. 
Okay. Typically, when we do this, we provide something called an SAF file. And what these contain is just where are the exons and how do they relate to each other, i.e. which gene, which transcript do they belong to. And to build your own SAF file, you can also do something very similar to what we did for extracting the sequence information. There's another database called a TXDB. So this is your transcript database. And you can use the exons function once you load it in to extract out the transcript ID, the gene ID, and it's also going to give you the position. OK, so if we look here, here is a bunch of different um, uh, transcripts or a bunch of exons and which transcript they belong to. OK, and what gene they belong to. OK, so here's an example of this an exon. These are all the same or very similar exons. But you can see that they've slightly changed where the start site is. And so they get a different transcript ID. OK, so we create this exon object within R. We could then need to export it into this specific format, which would make it an SAF. And so that way, the aligner can recognize it as an SAF. OK, and so you need to first column needs to be a gene ID. Second column needs to be the chromosome. Then you need the start and, and the strand information. OK, and so this is in what we call a genomic ranges format. And so we first create it, convert it to a data frame using as.dataframe. And then we extract out the columns that we care about. So in this case, we're extracting out first, yeah, like the gene ID information, OK, and with the dollar sign. And so then once we collate all this together, we'll have something that's in the SAF format. And then once it's in the SAF format, we can then provide it to our, um, our alignment software. OK, and so we've after all these steps, we can finally do the alignment. We have two, two important, um, no, three important files that we've created, right? We have done our quality control on our fast queue, and this is the main input. Then we have our index file, which we're mapping to, and then we have our annot annotation reference. And so this contains information about where the genes are, where are the exons. And so with these three things, we can then do the mapping. Okay, and Charles asked the question, are we now in the part where we use salmon? No, salmon is coming very shortly. Okay, and so this is the subjunct. Uh, I'll just run through some of the arguments in here. So we do subjunct, we provide the annotation information. Well, this is the index file even. Then we have the fastq file. We say we want a BAM to come out of it. This is the name we want to come of that BAM that we want to come. We're saying we're going to use annotation information, and this is the name of that annotation. And then we tell it this isn't a GTF. You can use a GTF, that's fine. We just use an SAF. Okay. And then you have some thread information, and this is about optimizing the um, speed of your mapping. And you might want to dial this up or down depending on your computer setup. And so we've created a BAM. BAMs are great. Before we can use BAMs, though, they have to be sorted and indexed. OK. And all this is doing is organizing your BAM to make it much more easy to use with your computer. And a lot of the time, when um, you want to say use it with uh, a different program, it won't let you use it unless you've sorted it and indexed it, OK? And so the sorting puts everything in order, starting, say, chromosome 1 all the way down. Um, and then the indexing makes it um, it's like another little reference file so that when it starts to look, say, I want to look for chromosome something in chromosome 3, and it will know which line to jump down to and things like that. So it, it, these are important files for optimizing the use of these uh, BAMPs. 
Um, there is a package called RSAM tools, which you can load in, which takes care of this in two quick and easy steps. You just do library RSAM tools. And so this is the BAM file we created from our alignment. And so we do sort BAM, treg1.bam. So this is our input. And then it will create a file called sorted treg1. Kind of one of the nuances with using this is for some reason, it automatically expands, uh, uh, appends dot bam onto this. So the output file is sorted underscore treg underscore one dot bam. With index bam, then you have to write in the fact that it ends in dot bam. So this is chaining straight into this one, even though you've written slightly different things here. Um, but this is, it, it, it works fine. It's just a pet peeve of mine because I have to write something here and then I have to write something slightly different here. But once you've done this, you can then open the file in IGV. Now we won't go into detail into IGV um, today. Oh, sorry, I feel like I'm gonna sneeze. Um, no, I think it's gone. Okay. And we won't go into a super detail into IGV today, but we recommend everyone use IGV for viewing their, their data set. You can um, just open it. Um, let me, sh I'll just show you real quick. Um, so this is my whole screen. I have IGV down here. I just opened it. And so this it contains the entire genome. Okay. And so if you have a gene, a gene you really care about, so say, um, oh, that's not. So this is beta actin, right? And so it has the reference information here and it will load in track information here. So you can load in your BAM file and it will show you where the reads are piling up in the genome. So it's a really nice way of visualizing what your data set looks like, where alignments have happened. And you can start to compare between um, different conditions. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely running a little bit behind. Um, so next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about counting. I'll try and keep it uh, brief, but again, keep asking your questions because I think that's more important than us running a little late, okay? So once you've done this mapping, you know where things are, but you wanna be able to know in which genes they belong, okay? And so we've already know, uh, like looked at how to extract out information about genes and annotation using the TXDB objects, okay? And um, let me grab this. So we can use library TXDB to, to um, load in this, this database of transcripts. And then we can use a function called exonsby. And so what exonsby does is it does a similar thing to what we saw when we used exons, but it creates a list, okay? And so we're saying we want exons by gene. And so this means it will create, um, I'll show you, Did we show? yeah, we show it here actually. Um, this means it has a list and every single entry in the list is a gene. And within that, it tells you what exons are associated with that gene. So we have this gene, this is the ID for this gene. Um, and it has all of these different exons associated with it, okay? You can see a lot of these exons um, actually overlap. So they might be one exon's this big and then this exon's this big and they overlap with each other. So we wanna be able to count in these regions because we don't, um, most of the time, you're not counting intronic reads, right? Most of the time you don't care about the introns because if you're looking at steady state RNA-seq, this is being um, decayed away um, and things like that. So you're not really preserving it. So you don't need it to count towards um, your final uh, counts. Um, we have a question from Charles. Can we include the mitochondrial genome when we build the reference? Yeah, yeah, so we did in this case um, include the mitochondria. Sometimes we filter out depending on what we're looking at. Um, if they're not interested, people aren't interested in the mitochondria a lot of the time. So we'll filter, filter those reads out. 
um, because quite often they have um, it makes um, estimation of things um, harder because it has quite different properties associated with with transcripts from the mitochondria. Um, however, you can definitely keep them in. Um, just, just you just have to keep in keep in your mind that they behave quite differently. The other thing is, if depending on your experiment, you might actually have no reads from the mitochondria, and then if that's the case, um, that can trigger errors if you have it in your index file, um, depending on what you, workflow you're working with. Um, and so it's looking for mitochondrial reads, and then there's not none, and so it gets upset about that. Um, so build it in, and include it. Um, and it will work for the alignment. It just might be in later steps in your workflow and that you have to like remove the consideration of mitochondria. Um, but yeah, we in, like in this case, when we built the index, we included mitochondria. Um, yeah, so when we get to counting, these steps are all we need to, to understand where we want to count. Okay, and this in this single function x on by, we've extracted out all the information about where we want to count because we're getting all the exons and it's ordered by gene. Then, to be able to do the counting, we just need the bound file as well. So we'll have where we're counting and we'll, and all the reads, and then we provide it to this function called summarize overlaps. Okay, and so to help optimize this. There is a specialized function, which again, this is an important step for when you consider memory on your computer. Um, there is a step called BAM file. So what this, what this does here is we have this BAM file function. We give it um, our BAM or where our BAM is and we say yield size. And so this means we're only gonna read in 10,000 reads at once. And so by controlling this number, you can reduce the amount of memory you're using at once so that your computer can handle it. So if you don't have a high memory computer, you can lower this number. Um, likewise, you can also, if you feel like it's going really, really slowly, you can increase this number and see how, how much you can push your computer. And so that when it does this counting, it's only gonna, uh, like I said, count in 10,000 uh, 10, at once. And so we've created this little BAM file. This is like a settings, essentially. This BAM file settings, we give it to my BAM, and then we uh, give it to summarize overlaps. And so we tell summarize overlaps where we want to count. So this is this object here with all the Exxon information in it. And we give it these BAM settings, like where this BAM is and how, how much we want to read in at once. And what this does, it creates an object called range summarize experiment. Okay, this is a specialist bioconductor object. It's a um, really useful type of object. Um, and a lot of different packages within bioconductor use it. So it has a similar format to everything else. So that's one of the really nice things about bioconductor is once you learn how to do one thing, and if it's in bioconductor style, then quite often other packages will like also feed into it or go from it. And so we have this range summarized experiment. It has 24,000 different um, genes or uh, yeah, genes that we're counting over. It's a count style. And um, you can see the row names here are each of the gene IDs and the call names. So we have one column. The call names is that band file that we provided. And so you can do this also with multiple BAMs at once. So if you want, you can provide, instead of BAM file, you do BAM file list and you provide several BAMs and then it will count over your entire experiment at once. Um, yeah, and so then um, what we're doing there is a, a, is a gene model, right? But sometimes you wanna consider it on a, very much on an exon level. Um, and so when we're doing this, sometimes we face issues, okay? And so you can see an issue here is we have these different exons and 
they're overlapping. And so then how do you assign um, which, which read belongs to which? Okay. And so in that case, you need to build something called a disjoint exon. Disjoint exon. Okay. And so this really is actually more important for if you're doing differential transcript usage analysis. Um, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you are interested in that, you should you should go back and review these slides. Um, but because we're short of time, I'm not going to go too much into it. And I, all I'm going to say is what this does is it breaks up, say, one exon, right? Or we have three different exons. It breaks them up into a pattern which allows you to distinguish between um, the isoforms. Okay, so for example, this one is present in all three isoforms, while this one is only present in one. And by understanding the relative proportion, you can start to infer information about the isoform usage. Okay, and so there's specialist functions here for actually accessing this disjoint exons. Okay, but um, we'll skip that. Okay, and you can do counting within it. Okay, so you then have a range summarized experiment, um, which we produced it from our counting. And if we look in it, you can actually access it using the function assay. Okay. And if you look in it, what you can see is it's basically a counts table. Okay. And so on the right hand side or the left hand side, you have, um, we have it for both the gene on the exon. So the exon version is from our disjoint uh, counts, but you can essentially see how many counts you have per gene. And, and it's labeled on the left or per exon, depending on which style you did. Most important thing is assay allows you to access this information. Okay, and so that, that, is, that is it for counting, right? You have count information at this point, and then you can start to use that for differential gene expression analysis. And so what we really care about is this gene level count. Okay, Because when you have a gene level count, you can actually start to um, compare one gene, to, uh, one gene in one condition to the same gene in the, uh, another condition. And you can start to do differential gene expression analysis. Okay. Um, and so this last section is about using salmon. Okay. And so this is an alternative form of uh, counting analysis. And so I'll just run through this. It's relatively quickly because we are already pretty late. Um, and if you aren't um, super interested in learning other styles, um, I get it if you, you want to check out. Um, and there are exercises at the end. I'll just show you those now. So there's some exercises here. And I'll be going kind of over these a little bit in at 2.45. Okay, and then we'll restart going into the next section at three o'clock. Okay, so that's just a heads up for that. This should only take like 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes to go through. We do have a question from Corey. What do you recommend for people running Windows and can't use Salmon? What I would recommend is to run Salmon, okay? And I know that sounds uh, counterintuitive, but in, a win in Windows, there's ways to set up um, boxes or, or um, there's ways to set up uh, like windows in which you're um, like virtual machines. That's the word I'm trying to use, uh, find. There's something called a virtual machine, which allows you to say use Linux on your Windows machine. And then once you have your Linux running in your virtual machine, you can then run Salmon. You can set up, you can set up this whole workflow working in a Unix style. Um, it's less than ideal and it will be slower, but um, it, it's probably worth it to learn how to do that because this Windows is the most underserved system for bioinformatics tools. Most people build it for Linux first, then Mac, then Windows. So, um, yeah, that is my advice. There are other tools I do not, off the top of my head, know. Like, for, for example, like this Callisto, that's an, another couple, a, a common pseudo aligner. I don't know if it's available on Windows. 
Um, so you can look at other pseudo aligners um, and do a little comparison and see which ones are available on Windows or not. Um, but Salmon works really well. And so we, we like it. And so um, for consistency sake, I'd say like a virtual machine and you can look into setting one of those up. If you're really struggling with that, you can always reach up to us and we can see if we can help depending on your setup. Okay. Um, and so I just talked a lot about pseudo aligners, but unless you're really into rna seq you might not know what they are. And so a typical rna seq experiment, what we've talked about is alignment, and that's finding out the exact position of a read. Okay, you're going, this belongs to chromosome two at this specific place. Pseudo aligner works slightly differently, um, and it breaks a read down into these kamers. So different small amounts of, um, small amounts of your reads, so maybe like 10 bases at a time or something like that. And it has similar kamers um, in its index for the genome. And then it does some comparisons of these small, small sections and um, sees where, which gene is it most likely to align to, or which gene are most of the kamers most similar to, okay? And so, what this does by um, breaking things down into these small, smaller chunks and then kind of saying how many of these correspond to here, which one is the best hit, um, it speeds things up quite considerably. But what you do lack is saying, hey, this read starts at chromosome two at exactly this position. You don't get that information, but you'll be able to estimate abundance still, um, which is normally the end goal with with this kind of analysis so this kind of it takes takes it with one hand but gives with the other you get speed you still get counts but you don't get position um okay and so that's 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 um pretty much that summarized it will for people working on personal computers it will work faster right it's it's a faster process it will work better on your computer than in a proper alignment um, but it has been a while since I've done a side-by-side -side comparison, so it might not be that different these days because algorithms get optimized all the time. So I think alignment is catching up again. Um, so yeah, we have Salmon. We also mentioned Callisto here, um, but I'm not sure which one they're available on. Uh, our chart, so Charles, the question, yeah, what is the disadvantage? So you don't get position information. That's like the big disadvantage. So if I do pseudo alignment, it isn't actually aligning where a single read is. Um, and so I can't put it into IGV. I can't look at um, a track and go, oh, I have lots here. Instead, it's, going, it's aggregating all the information together for a gene and it's going, I think we have 20 counts. And normally it's right. Um, Okay. Yep, you can get TPM for each gene. Okay, so the question was, can I get TPM? So it's good for abundance. So by abundance, I mean counts, or you can convert that to something like a TPM. Um, it's just not good for knowing exactly where each read is. So if you want to do visualizations with IGV, you want to do a track where you, where you show a gene and you show how much you have in each of the exons and how it's different to the other for on an individual use case, you can't do that. Um, but it's, it's significantly quicker and it's, it's very similar result for the counting and abundance. Okay, so as I've mentioned, there's no R package, but you can get access to it through Conda, okay? And so Anaconda is a like repository of packages that are typically based in Python and other tool and other uh, services as well and other uh, programming, but it's typically Python based. But R and R and Python are getting more and more friendly with each other, and we actually built a built a tool called Herper, which helps you kind of handle things in Anaconda um, through R. Um, and so to do this, you just do you can load in Herper. And then um, you should be able to do install Conda tools. And what this does is it installs a version of Miniconda on your computer at a default location. 
but you can control that if you want. I think that was an issue we we're having earlier. You can specify a path to Miniconda to be a, sp a specific location. And then it will install Salmon within it. And so within Conda, you can have lots of different environments. And so in this case, we're installing Salmon within an environment for RNA-seq analysis. And so when you do this, you then have Salmon on your, your worktop or on your laptop or wherever, workstation. Um, and so then Salmon is available to you. And so we can just call Salmon from within R. So you can stay within R for everything if you want. Like we're big, big into R, as you can tell. So we like to just keep everything within R and then we know how to make everything super reproducible while staying within R. So that's what we do. And so when you do this, it um, you can actually get the path to where Salmon is. It outputs it here. Okay. And so um, to be able to run Salmon, you again have to build an index. It requires it in a slightly, um, slightly different format, but we show you how to do that here. Here, we're extracting out all the transcript information for BS genome with the TXDB object, okay? So it's giving the full sequence information for a given transcript. Okay, and it creates this object called all transcript seek. Okay. And that again is a DNA string set, so you can write it. So we just created, this is a very similar FASTA to what we created for um, at the beginning um, for the original alignment, but it's transcript focused, right? Because in this case, we're doing counting of transcripts. So we just, we don't need to consider the entire genome. Um, and so when you do this, you also create a decoy sequence. So um, when you run Salmon, you tell it, these are the regions I care about. These are my transcripts, but this is the wider context of what the genome looks like. And so if something that's um, um, external, like could be like, uh, I don't know, like noise or spurious reads from somewhere else, you can downweight it um, using these decoy sequences. Um, and so again, we extract out the, um, the entire thing and we put it together and we call it a gentrum, okay? Um, but what this is, is it's a combination of the entire chromosome sets and just the transcript, transcript sets, okay? And then we write that out. And we we call it the um, yeah we call it the gentrome, and then we need to write some information about the decoy. Okay, so this is a quick table that has the information about the decoy information. Okay, not going to go super into into this setup just because we're really running late. Um, so sorry about that, but you can look back into it. It's 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 pretty straightforward. You're just creating a data frame that points to different things. Okay, and so for running this, all we need to do then is, so Charles is asking, can the Herper installation of Salmon be performed on Windows? Last time I checked, no. Um, potentially since I last checked that there are issues, uh, or they've made a Windows version, but yeah, okay. So it can't be, Corey tried. So, yeah, and so the issue with that is Salmon hasn't been built on Windows. Um, it hasn't been tried on Windows, and unfortunately, we can't do that. That's, they're a different team doing different things, so, yeah. Um, and they, again, Windows is pretty underserved for um, bioinformatics tools. Um, yeah, so to run Salmon, First, we need to build the index. So we do, it's a sam, salmon index. We give it um, the input information and the, uh, the FASTA file. Um, and so to, to run this within R, so this is what we'd run on the command line. Um, to run it within R, what we need to do is use um, Herper. And so what Herper would say is, 
with this conda environment. So we're saying with this in conda environment here, which is where we installed salmon, I want to run do a system call. And so this is calling as calling this a, a direct system call. So it's similar to running a command line call. And it's saying, I want to run salmon. I want to run salmon index with this um, name. So this is the, going to be the index name that's produced and this faster of the transcripts. Okay. And then you can control things like standard out. So this gives you error messages and things like that. And so all we're doing with this is it was saying we want to use Conda and we want to use this specific environment within Conda and we want to do a system call. And this is going to do the indexing for salmon. And so once you build um, an index, you can then start to run salmon. There is also, we built a decoy. Generally, it's better to work with a decoy. So I recommend doing the decoy option. Um, and so there's an additional variable here, which is minus D. And so you give it the decoy information and it will build the index and consider the entire genome. So this is just really giving the align, um, the pseudo aligner some background information about the, the um, genome, as opposed to just focusing on just the transcripts. And then once you've done that, it's just as simple, simple as running salmon quant. Okay? So this is the full command. If you were to just do it on the command line or in terminal, Okay, so I say, I want to do this fastq.gz. I want it to have this name. Okay, and this is the index information. Okay, and we can just put that all into with Conda so we can run it through R instead. And so the output of that already counts our TPMs. So we got a question earlier about TPMs. It produces TPMs straight away. Um, it also tells you just the actual counts and the effective length and the uh, length of your transcript. Um, and it's all produced as this data frame, which is, is called a quant.sf. Um, and so that is pretty much the end of the session. We, yeah, we overran quite significantly. So apologies about that. Um, um, and what we'll be doing next time is we'll be um, starting to read some of this data in and doing differential uh, gene expression analysis. Okay. Um, Um, but yeah, so I will be, I, I will be here, I'll be loitering around um, during the break. I encourage, um, if you have time, if you want to, you can look at the exercises, but I get we just did an, a 90 minute session, so you might want a little break. Um, and we'll get back to differential gene uh, analysis uh, pretty shortly, okay? I'll be back here in 20 minutes to look at the answers if people are interested, but it's also then, so it's recorded for prosperity. Um, and if you're interested in just diving straight back into the next session, which is going to be um, session two, okay? And um, we'll be doing that at three, okay? Um, if also, if you have any questions about the, the, the session that we just had, um, you can put them in the chat and I'll go over them. Um, in this, in the meantime, okay. I'm going to stop record, stop sharing, and stop recording for now. Um, and I will um, the recording. Okay. Okay. So actually, we just got a question. Um, Charles Zhu um, says error could not find function R plus P. So let's see, I'll show you the steps involved. Okay, so make this a little smaller. Hopefully everyone can see my R studio and they can see this. And so,
Hmm. Interesting. That's an interesting problem from Corey. Okay, so if I go to, um, we have link to exercise and link to answers. The main difference between the two is um, one, in the exercises, it has none of the actual code, but it shows you the expected outputs. Okay, so in this case, you can see the plots, you can see some data, uh, QC summary data frames, but you can't see the code. If you go to link to answers, it has everything. Okay, and so some people are having some issue with R plus P. So let me show you running here. Um, and so hopefully everyone ran like so. I, all I did to load it in was BioC Manager install, um, and then I do R plus P. Okay, so that's all you have to do to install it. I'm not going to run it now because it's already installed. Okay, then I load it in with rfastp. You should then be able to do the rfastp function. So if I just did like this, it shows me the function. Lots of stuff in here, but this is the code. I can also do question mark rfastp. So if we start with um, Charles's error, you cannot find function rfastp. That either means it's not installed or it's not loaded in. Okay, so you're gonna have to rerun BioC Manager install and double check that you haven't got an error. And then you need to make sure you load it in. So every package you have to load it in first. So you can do that with library. Okay. If you've done both of those things and it can't find RFSP, let me know because that's a very weird issue. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what the solution would be. We might have to talk about it um, in a little bit. Okay, so next up, we should have, there is this, um, we want you to run rfastp on this sampled file. Okay, so if I was to look in the, if I do, uh, so what I do here is dir data. So this tells me what data is available to you in the data directory. Okay, and one of them should be this file here. Okay, and that one's right here. Okay, so one would hope that um, I can see it. It knows it's where it knows where it is because I've set the correct working directory here. This is where I downloaded it, and I'm going to our course. And um, I could then do this, and it runs. Ooh, and I get the same error. Okay, this is weird. Because it this okay, so it passed our tests, but I guess there's an erroring out. So okay, well that should have worked, but it didn't. So this means there's something wrong with this uh, FastQ file. But I'll I'll double check that. Let me write a note. But more likely than not, because this has an error, and if I then do QC summary, I'm, I'm doubting it's going to do anything. Oh, yeah. So you can run QC summary, but there's no after QC, right? So it has all the information for the pre QC, but not the after QC. Okay. So sorry to, yeah, sorry, Corey and, in, and Indita, if anyone else. Yeah, Sang. It seems that there's something wrong with this FastQ file. Um, it shouldn't have passed all the checks. Normally there's checks, and I ran this myself. Um, I ran all of this code uh, yesterday, so it should have worked, but something seems to have gone on when it's been uh, sent up to GitHub where we host everything. So I'm going to double check this at a later date, probably this, this evening, and get it fixed for you. Um, but we can still run some of the code that we, we expect. It's just, we're not gonna have the after QC section. Um, and so what we wanted to do is I asked you to check the QC summary once you've run our fast P and then look at the GC and quality curves. Um, and so let's first look at the quality curves. Okay, yeah, so these won't work because it doesn't have a second section, okay. And you can see it is working on the GitHub. 
hmm, this is this is a curious problem. It's not working. It's working here. You can see it's working here, um, but it's not working here. Um, I'll tell you what to do. I know that we have in data. Here you go. If you do load data JSON report to our data, what this will do is I actually save this JSON report. So if you load it in, there should be a new JSON report. If I do QC summary on that. Hey. It's like we ran the RFASP and it worked. So then I can look at the curve and I get a nice curve back, okay? And you can see again, just like we did um, in the actual session, there's a slight bump in the QC after, uh, in the quality after the QC filtering. And then we can modify the curve plot. No, do you need to be, no, if you've downloaded the content from GitHub, Everything's contained within it. So if we remember, I have, I can show you, I have this, I downloaded this folder. It's on my desktop. Um, and all I did was I did, um, I ran this command. So it set my working directory. So this is the viewpoint of your R, where it's looking to. And I set it to be in my desktop in RNA seq. So this is the, the download. Um, and then I went into our course, which is where all the data folders contained. And so then the load I just did, load data, it's, a, it's an object in the data folder. Um, did Jesse, if you don't know where to get the download from, um, it's on the rock, it's on the course homepage, but I can navigate to it to just point at it if you need to, if you need be. Yes, yes. So, um, hmm. okay. So, let's see. I would, uh, Jesse, I would hazard a guess to say you're not in the correct working directory. I would use maybe, um, can you do? D, um, if you do git wd, you can see where I am. Yours should match this, except this top section should be wherever you saved the download. Okay. Seems that Sang is doing good. Um, and I have a question from Charles. How do I evaluate the data quality from the plot? Does the QC mean some data are filtered out with the QC? Yes. So RFASP has some quality control steps. Um, Here's what we're looking at. And you can kind of start to look at some of the defaults with this. Um, but for it to be filtered out, it's like how many times can something be repeated? And um, there's trimming options, quality filter, quality filter percent. Um, this is there's a lot of different options. But if something basically, typically the um, the reads that are filtered out are ones where they're full of ends, full of ends, full of um, low quality uh, sequences. And so you can see before, before and after QC, um, you can see that we have fewer reads if you look at the total read section. So we've filtered some out. Okay. Uh, okay, so it seems that it's still not working, but yeah, Jesse, I'm not entirely sure if it's, um, it might be when, it could be potentially when you downloaded it. So I was working on this course as well until um, the end of last week. So depending on when you downloaded this, 
depending on when you downloaded this, that file may not have existed. I think I, me I mentioned that I'll be making updates until, um, until just before we do the course. And so you may need to just re-download the course content. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think that's gonna be our answer, Jesse. And yeah, with regards to the fast queue, it seems that there's been some kind of corruption or something gone wrong that's funky in the data transfer from my machine up into GitHub. And so that might explain that. And so if the plot looks weird, okay, so what does weird look like? If the plot looks weird, if it doesn't look, like this is kind of what we expect. We expect kind of low quality towards the beginning and then it gets good and then it kind of tails off again. If it if uh, it deviates from that, or if say the quality scores are actually significantly lower, um, then I'd start to dig into the fast queue a little bit more, try and understand what's causing that. Um, try and understand, did this affect all of the samples or just one sample? Um, then I start to get into a much more expansive um, questions about fast queue quality and things like that. Yeah, so this is a starting point. Um, hopefully you'll do this and things look reasonable um, and you won't have too much sample to sample variation. I think that's the big thing we're looking for. We're only looking at one sample in isolation here, but ideally when you do this for many samples, they all look very similar. Um, yeah, because if you have technical problems, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the world as long as it's not a technical problem that's just affecting one sample. If it's affecting every sample equally, then there are some caveats in your experiment, but at least they're comparable to one another, as opposed to if you're comparing condition A to condition B and there's technical stuff in A and not in B, then that becomes an issue. Okay, so then it's, it's actually, it's already three. So I'm just gonna um, just quickly say, quickly go through this. We then show you how to do alignment. Most, most of you would have um, at this time, um, like this first step is exactly the same step as what we covered in, in the course itself. We extract out the FASTA files, we do a DNA string set and we'd write it to a, write it to a FASTA. We then get the annotation information here and create an SAF file. And then we run our subread. We build the index and then we do subject. Okay, so this is identical to what we did in the course. We've just changed what fast queue files are going in. Okay, and then we have to remember at the end you always sort an index. Yes, R fast P. So if I look here, I've run R fast P here. Let's do Joe. So you can see my R fast P outputs. I've run R fast P twice, and so you can see here. Um, these are FASTQ files that are products of RFASP. The big thing, when you run RFASP, this output FASTQ controls what this name will be. Um, and so everything related to the KDA is here, these three. So we have another report here and the FASTQ information. I could actually, um, I mean, so this is where I am. This is where I created it. If I click on the HTML, for example, and I'll drag this over. This is the HTML version of the report. So it has a little bit more information. Um, this is actually the one that failed. So let me do this one. So there's a bit more information here. It's a HTML report um, and it contains some of this kind of quality scores. It's a bit more interactive, but we don't typically, we, I'm kind of showing you how to get some of these things while you're still in R, um, but you can just use the report itself as well. So I showed you how to do kind of this uh, alignment uh, and this, this should actually say counting. Counting. 
And so again, this is pretty much exactly the same. We collect the exons by information and we do, um, um, yeah, we collect the exons by information to get it to know where we want to count. And then we do summarize overlaps and we're doing it within these exons. We're doing it with this BAM file we just created. So again, this is a carbon copy of what we did in the, um, in the, in the actual course slides, except we're changing the name because we're looking at the second replica. We do ask that you plot a density plot of the log 10 recounts across genes on chromosome 10. Okay, so this is so you can get an idea of the distribution of how many counts you typically get per gene. Okay, and so we do have information on how to do that with ggplot. So you'll convert your count into a data frame and then you would um, use a geom, .density, or geom underscore density and we want a scale plus log 10. Okay. And then the last part is how to do this with salmon. And so it's, again, it's the same. Same as what we do in the course, except we're changing the names. And so this is, um, we kind of talked a little bit about TPM and num reads. They are functionally slightly different. Oh, great. I'm glad it worked, Jesse. Um, so you can actually read in this quant SF file from Salmon and you can do a comparison of things like your num reads versus TPM. If you remember, um, if, you, if you're unsure, we have, we're not gonna talk too much about TPMs, but TPMs are tags per million and they have been normalized to account for read depth. So the number of, uh, of reads that you have in your sample and also the, the length of the, um, each gene. So you expect there to be some similarity, like there should be positive correlation between them, but it's not gonna be perfect because shorter genes will be um, penalized against, um, or no, longer genes will be penalized against in the TPM, while shorter genes will be um, have a, a higher score. Okay. And so you can see that they do have this positive correlation, but there are some shifting about and it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, so that is the exercises.